If you think about the phone, and Intel has tested a lot of the things that I'm going to show you over the last uh, 10 years in about 600 elderly households, 300 in Ireland and 300 in Portland, trying to understand how do we measure and monitor behavior in a medically meaningful way. And if you think about the phone, right, it's something that we can use for some incredible ways to help people actually take the right medication at the right time. We're testing these kinds of simple sensor network technologies in the home so that any phone that a senior is already comfortable with can help them deal with their medications. And a lot of what they do is they pick up the phone and it's our system whispering to them which pill they need to take and they fake like they're having a conversation with a friend and they're not embarrassed by a meds caddy that's ugly that sits on their kitchen table and says, I'm old, I'm frail, right? It's surreptitious technology that's helping them do a simple task of taking the right pill at the right time. Now, we also do some pretty amazing things with these phones because that moment when you answer the phone is a cognitive test every time that you do it. Think about it, all right? I'm gonna answer the phone three different times. Hello? Hey. All right, that's the first time. Hello? Uh, hey. Hello? Uh, who? Oh, hey, all right? Very big differences between the way I answered the phone the three times. And as we monitor phone usage by seniors over a long period of time, down the tenths of a microsecond, that recognition moment of whether they can figure out that person on the other end is a friend and we start talking them to it immediately, or they do a lot of what's called trouble talk, where they're like, wait, who is this? Oh, right? Waiting for that recognition moment may be the best early indicator of the onset of dementia than anything that shows up clinically today. We call these behavioral markers. There's lots of others. Is the person going to the phone as quickly when it rings as they used to? Is it a hearing problem or is it a physicality problem? Has their voice gotten more quiet? We're doing a lot of work with people with Alzheimer's and particularly with Parkinson's where that quiet voice that sometimes shows up with Parkinson's patients may be the best early indicator of Parkinson's five to 10 years before it shows up clinically, but those subtle changes in your voice over a long period of time are hard for you or your spouse to notice until it becomes so extreme and your voice has become so quiet. So sensors that are looking at that kind of voice. When you pick up the phone, how much tremor are you having and what is that like and what is that trend like over a period of time? Are you having more trouble dialing the phone than you used to? Is it a dexterity problem? Is it the onset of arthritis? Are you using the phone? Are you socializing less than you used to? and looking at that pattern, what does that decline in social health mean as a kind of a vital sign of the future? And then, wow, what a radical idea. We, except in the United States, might be able to use this newfangled technology to actually interact with a nurse or a doctor on the other end of the line. What a what great day that will be once we're allowed to actually do those kinds of things. So these are what I would call behavioral markers. And it's the whole field that we've been trying to work on for the last, Intel, last 10 years at Intel. How do you put simple disruptive technologies in the first of five phrases that I'm gonna talk about in this talk? Behavioral markers matter. How do we change behavior? But how do we measure changes in behavior in a meaningful way that's gonna help us with prevention of disease, early onset of disease, and tracking the progression of disease over a period of time? Now, why would Intel let me uh, spend a lot of time and money over the last 10 years trying to understand the needs of seniors and start thinking about these kinds of behavioral markers. And you know, this is some of the field work that we've done. Uh, we have now lived with 1,000 elderly households in 20 countries over the last 10 years. We study people in Rochester, New York. We go live with them in the winter because what they do in the winter and their access to health care and how much they socialize is very different than the summer. If they have a hip fracture, we go with them and we study their entire discharge experience. If they have a family member who's a key part of their care network, we fly and study them as well. So we study the holistic health of experience of 1,000 seniors over the last 10 years in 20 different countries. Why is Intel willing to fund that? It's because of the second slogan that I want to talk about. 10 years ago, when I started trying to convince Intel to let me go start looking at disruptive technologies that could help with independent living, this is what I called it, Y2K plus 10. You know, back in 2000, we were all so obsessed with paying attention to the aging of our computers and whether or not they were going to survive the tick of the clock from 1999 to 2000 that we missed a moment that only demographers were paying attention to. It was right around New Year's. 
in that switchover when we had the larger number of older people on the planet for the first time than younger people. For the first time in human history, and barring aliens landing or some major other uh, pandemic, that's the expectation from demographers going forward. And 10 years ago, it seemed like I had a lot of time to convince Intel to work on this, right? Y2K plus 10 was coming, the baby boomers starting to retire. Well, folks, it's like we know these demographics here. This is a map of the entire world. It's like the lights are on, but nobody's home on this demographic Y2K plus 10 problem, right? I mean, we, we sort of get it here, but we don't get it here, and we're not doing anything about it. The health reform bill is largely ignoring the realities of the age wave that's coming and the implications for what we need to do to change not only how we pay for care, but deliver care in some radically different ways. And in fact, you know, it's upon us. I mean, you probably saw these headlines. This is Catherine Casey, who was the first boomer to actually get Social Security. That actually occurred this year. She took early retirement. She was born one second after midnight in 1946 and a retired school teacher. There she is with the Social Security Administrator, the first boomer. Actually, we didn't even wait till 2011 next year. We're already starting to see early retirement occur this year. Right? So it's here. This Y2K plus 10 problem is at our door. This is, you know, 50 tsunamis scheduled on the calendar, but somehow we can't sort of marshal our government and innovative forces to sort of get out in front of it and do something about it. We'll wait until it's more of a catastrophe and react as opposed to prepare for it. So one of the reasons it's so challenging to prepare for this Y2K problem is I want to argue we have what I would call mainframe poisoning. Andy Grove, about six or seven years ago, he doesn't even know, remember this, uh, in a Fortune magazine article, he used the, fr the phrase mainframe healthcare. And I've been extending and expanding this. He saw it written down somewhere. He's like, Eric, that's a really cool concept. It's like, actually, it was your idea. You said it in a Fortune magazine article. I just extended it. You know, this is the mainframe. This mentality of traveling to and time-sharing large, expensive healthcare systems actually began in 1787. This is the first general hospital in Vienna. And actually, the second general hospital in Vienna in about 1850 was where we started to build out an entire curriculum for teaching med students specialties. And it's a place in which we started developing architecture that literally divided the body and divided care into departments and compartments. And it was reflected in our architecture. It was reflected in the way that we taught students. And this mainframe mentality has persisted today. Now, I'm not anti-hospital. With my own healthcare problems, I've taken drug therapies, I travel to this hospital and others many, many times. But we worship the high hospital on a hill, right? And this is mainframe healthcare. And just as, you know, 30 years ago, we couldn't conceive that we would have the power of a mainframe computer that took up a room this size in our purses and on our belts that we're carrying around on our cell phone today, you know, and suddenly, Computing that used to be an expert-driven system it was a personal system that we all own as part of our daily lives. That shift from mainframe to personal computing is what we have to do for healthcare. We have to shift from this mainframe mentality of healthcare to a personal model of healthcare. We are obsessed with this way of thinking. When Intel does surveys all around the world and we say, quick response, healthcare, the first word that comes up is doctor, the second that comes up is hospital, and the third is illness or sickness. Right? It is, we are wired in our imagination to think about healthcare and healthcare innovation as something that goes into that place. Our entire health reform discussion right now, health IT, when we talk to it with policymakers, equals how are we going to get doctors using electronic medical records in the mainframe? We're not thinking about how do we shift from the mainframe to the home. And the problem with this is the way we conceive healthcare, right? This is a very reactive, crisis driven system. We're doing 15 minute exams with patients. It's population based. We collect a bunch of biological information in this artificial setting and we fix them up like Humpty Dumpty all over again and send them home and hope we might hand them a brochure, maybe an interactive website that they do as asked and don't come back into the mainframe. And the problem is we can't afford it today, folks. We can't afford mainframe healthcare today to include the uninsured, and now we want to do a double-double of the age wave coming through. Business as usual in healthcare is broken, and we've got to do something different. We've got to focus on the home. We've got to focus on a personal healthcare paradigm that moves care to the home. How do we be more proactive, prevention-driven? How do we collect vital signs and other kinds of information 24 by 7? How do we get a personal baseline about what's going to work for you? How do we collect not just biological data, but behavioral data, psychological data, relational data, in and on and around the home? And how do we drive compliance to be a customized care plan that uses all this great technology that's around us to change our behavior? 
That's what we need to do for a personal health model. I want to give you a couple of examples. This is Mimi from one of our studies. In her 90s, had to move out of her home because her family was worried about falls. Raise your hand if you had a serious fall in your household or any of your loved ones, your parents, or so forth. Right? Classic. Hip fracture often leads to institutionalization of a senior. This is what was happening to Mimi, or the family was worried about it, moved her out of her own home into an assisted living facility. She tripped over her oxygen tank. Many people in this generation won't press the button even if they have an alert call system because they don't want to bother anybody even though they've been paying $30 a month. Boomers will press the button, trust me. They're going to be pressing that button nonstop, <laughs> right? Mimi got, uh, broke her pelvis, lay all night, all morning. Finally, somebody came in and found her, sent her to the hospital. They fixed her back up. She was never going to be able to move back into the assisted living. They put her into the nursing home unit. First night in the nursing home unit where she had been in the same assisted living facility, moved her from one bed to another, kind of threw her, rebroke her pelvis, sent her back to the hospital that she had just come from. No one read the chart, put her on Tylenol, which she's allergic to, broke out, got bed sores, basically had heart problems, and died from the fall and the complications and the errors that were there. Now, the most frightening thing about this is, this is my wife's Grandmother. Now, I'm Eric Dishman. I speak English. I work for Intel. I make a good salary. Uh, I'm smart about falls and fall-related injuries. It's an area of research that I work on. I have access to senators and CEOs. I can't stop this from happening. What happens if you don't have money, don't speak English, or don't have the kind of access to deal with these kinds of problems that inevitably occur? How do we actually prevent the vast majority of falls from ever occurring in the first place? Let me give you a quick example of work that we're doing to try to do exactly that. I've been wearing a little technology that we call Shimmer. It's a research platform. It has accelerometry. You can plug in a three-lead ECG. There's all kinds of sort of plug-and-play kind of Legos that you can do to capture in the wild, in the real world, things like trimmer, gait, stride length, and those kinds of things. The problem is our understanding of falls today, like Mimi, is get a survey in the mail three months after you fell from the state saying, what were you doing when you fell? That's sort of the state of the art. But with something like Shimmer, or we have something called the magic carpet, embedded sensors in carpet, or camera-based systems that we've borrowed from sports medicine, we're starting for the first time in those 600 elderly households to collect actual kinematic motion data to understand what are the subtle changes that are occurring that can show us that mom has become risk at falls. And most often we can do two interventions. Fix the meds mix. I'm a qualitative researcher, but when I look at these data streams coming in from these homes, I can look at the data and tell you the day that some doctor prescribed them something that nobody else knew that they were on because we see the changes in their patterns in the household, right? These discoveries of behavioral markers and behavioral changes are game changing and like the discovery of the microscope because we're collecting data streams that we've actually never done before. This is an example in our Trill Clinic in Ireland of uh, actually what you're seeing is she's looking at data in this picture from the magic carpet. So we have a little carpet that you can look at your amount of postural sway and look at the changes in your postural sway over many months. Here's what some of this data might look like. This is actually sensor firings. Uh, these are two different subjects in our study. It's about uh, a year's worth of data. The color represents different rooms they are in the house. This person on the left is living in their own home. This person on the right is actually living in an assisted living facility. I know this because look at how punctuated mealtime is when they're no longer in their particular rooms here, right? Now, this doesn't mean that much to you, but when we look at these cycles of data over a longer period of time, and we're looking at everything from motion around different rooms in the house to sort of micro motions that Shimmer picks up about gait and stride length, these streams of data are starting to tell us things about behavioral patterns that we never understood before. And you can go to orchitect.org. It has nothing to do with whales. It's the Oregon Center for Aging and Technology to see more about that. The problem is Intel is still one of the largest funders in the world of independent living technology research. I'm not bragging about how much we fund. It's how little anyone else actually pays attention to aging and funds innovation on aging, chronic disease management, and independent living in the home. So my mantra here, my fourth slogan is 10,000 households are bust. We need to drive a national, if not international, Framingham-type heart study of independent living technologies where we have 10,000 elderly connected house households with broadband, full medical characterization, and a platform by which we can start to experiment and turn these from 20 household anecdotal studies that the universities fund to large clinical trials that prove out the value of these technologies. So 10,000 households are bust. These are just some of the households that we've done in the Intel studies. 
My fifth and final phrase. I have tried for two years, and there were moments where we were quite close, to make this healthcare reform bill be about reform from something and to something, from a mainframe model to a personal health model, or to mean something more than just a debate about the public option and how we're going to finance. It doesn't matter how we finance healthcare. We're going to figure something out for the next 10 years and try it. No matter who pays for it, we better start doing care in a fundamentally different way and treating the home and the patient and the family member and the caregivers as part of these coordinated care teams and using disruptive technologies that are already here to do care in some pretty fundamental, pretty fundamental different ways. The president needs to stand up and say, at the end of healthcare reform debate, our goal as a country is to move 50% of care out of institutions, clinics, hospitals, and nursing homes to the home in 10 years. It's achievable. We should do it economically, we should do it morally, and we should do it for quality of life. But there's no goal within all this health reform. It's just a mess today. So, you know, that's my last message to you. How do we set a going to the moon goal of dealing with the Y2K plus 10 problem that's coming? It's not that innovation and technology is going to be the magic pill that cures all, but it's going to be part of the solution. And if we don't create a personal health movement, something that we're all aiming towards in reform, then we're going to move nowhere. So I hope you'll turn this conference into that kind of movement forward. Thanks very much.